Hey, what's up, Well Church? Welcome to Church Online. Uh, we're glad that you're joining us here today. I know it's a little different, and we were hoping that we wouldn't have to do this, but we had kind of suspected, so we're glad that we're able to do this and join each other and, and worship and, and growing together online and staying connected in the midst of COVID-19. So uh, I hope that you will just continue to pray for our church and for those around us for good health and uh, join us as we begin to worship together today. presence with nothing but you give us more than enough there's nothing your presence leaves wanting there's nobody you couldn't love yours is the kingdom we want to see it now. Yours is the power. So, Lord, send your spirit down. Yours is the glory. And we feel it all around. Forever and ever, you're pouring it out. So, blessed be a thousand chances. Suffer with the Savior through it all. And help us see your kingdom's not a nation. The righteous and the pagan all belong in your kingdom. In your kingdom. us out of our comfort. You're calling us out of our comfort. To light up the darkest of nights. To offer the hope of your wonder. To saints and the sinners alive. But yours is the one should be left out yours is the power to turn it all upside down yours is the glory to call every lost to found forever and ever our hopes in you now so blessed be a thousand generations
The kingdom's not a nation The righteous and the pagan All belong in your kingdom church it's been quite a week right we've been on edge around what direction our nation is going to take and maybe some of you have been very stressed out about that and very worried about that and there's still a lot of uncertainty out there and you know I've been thinking a lot about how do we have peace in the midst of difficult circumstances and I was taken back to uh, John 14 where Jesus is with his disciples and he's about to go to the cross and he's about to leave them and Their world is about to be turned upside down in a way that they just won't know what to do with it And he knows that and they don't quite understand it yet and his words in these final prayers and these final moments with his disciples are so important you know when you know that you're in your final moments with someone you don't waste time and there's something that he says to them right before all, you know he's about to be betrayed and all of that and in John 14 verse 27 he says peace I leave with you my peace I give you I do not give as the world gives do not let your heart be, be troubled and do not be afraid and I know that as we look about our world right now, there's a lot of troubled hearts and there's a lot of fearful people because a lot of people put their peace in the wrong places. But for us, we find our peace in the peace that Jesus has given us and it's something that can't be taken, it's something that can't be shaken, it's something that can't be rattled, it doesn't matter who sits in office, it doesn't matter uh, what nations rise and fall, Jesus is still Lord of all. And so when we take communion, when we come together, I'm going to invite you right now to grab your communion elements. We're going to take communion together in just a moment here. When we take communion, when we take the bread and the cup, it's this reminder of where we are grounded, where we find our identity, who it is that we are, whose we are, and that we can have peace no matter what, no matter what's going on in the world. And so, therefore, we remember that on the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed, and he said to his disciples, 
I give you my peace. We remember that he took the bread and after breaking it, he gave it to them. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Whenever you eat this, do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup of wine and he gave it to them. And he said, drink this, all of you, for this is my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. And so therefore, Jesus, we remember that even when the world shakes, even when it feels like there is no peace on the streets, even when it feels like everything is uncertain or upside down or we're elated by a circumstance, we're disappointed by a circumstance, Lord, your peace is not the same as the world gives. Lord, your peace is constant and we do not need to be troubled and we do not need to be afraid. We thank you for this tangible symbol to remind us who we are and whose we are in the midst of all the things that go on around us. Thank you for uniting us even when we can't be in a room together. We're reminded what it is that makes us brothers and sisters and it's in you, Jesus. And we pray this in your holy name. Amen. Won't let the storm weather my heart. Won't let the darkness break me down. Sing in the night my hope alive you. I walk through the fire and not be burned. Pray in the fire and watch it turn. Sing in tonight, I give it all to you. Yeah, I won't let the storm weather my heart. Won't let the darkness beat me down Sing in the night my hope will light you And I'll walk through the fire and not be burned Pray in the fire and watch it turn Jesus, tonight I give it all to you Yeah Say I won't let the storm weather my heart Won't let the darkness beat me down my hope life in you, yeah. And I'll walk through the fire and not be burned. Pray in the night and watch it turn. Jesus, tonight I give it all to you. Cause even when the world shakes, even when the fire calls, even when the wars wage, I take heart. I know you are greater, forever you are Savior, I will sing your praise. With all that I have, with all that I am, Lord. Hey, I'm Steve. Welcome to the online version of The Well Church. And just look what you can do online. You can just appear out of nowhere. Thanks for joining us here at The Well. And we wanted to connect with you today online. And one thing that I wanted to give you as an announcement is our C3 campaign, which is our way of connecting with you better. We're asking you to connect, to contribute, and to commit to The Well Church. We have a new all-in-one platform for giving, for emailing you and staying in touch, for you to stay in touch with us and give us prayer requests and for checking in to our service online. If you haven't connected with us through our new platform, everything you need to do is on our website or you can download the Church Center app on your smartphone and select The Well Church. Thank you so much for joining us online. I wanted to leave you today with a video from one of our young people, Jacob, who has recently committed to The Well Church. Take a look. Uh, my name is Jacob Friesen. I've been here at The Well for about 10 years. The Well Church is actually the first church that we tried, so I think it's a huge blessing from God that we ended up here and just stuck with it the last 10 years now. Um, we've had an opportunity to grow tremendously, me starting when I was 
eight or nine years old and now being somewhat of an adult. And just over the course of that last decade, I mean, we've had the opportunity to just meet a whole bunch of families I've gotten super close to, to be really connected to a church home for the first time in my life, for sure. Um, my mom and dad and brother and I have all had the opportunity to get baptized here and just through the conferences and through the mission trips and just through being able to serve in various capacities here at the church, we've gotten to really see a church grow and we've gotten to see a church be impacted by the people that serve in it and the people that are part of it. I think one thing that really sticks out to me is how powerful being a member of a church is. I think that being able to serve is one thing and being able to be a part of it is one thing and part of that comes with giving as well, you know? And in all honesty, I just started giving. I started giving about six to eight months ago around when the time of the pandemic hit because I recognized in myself that I wasn't able to serve how I was usually able to serve. I think when there was a time where we were unable to meet and we were unable to do things in a traditional capacity, we had to rely heavily on giving in order to continue to further this ministry. And it wasn't until then where, like I said, I've only been giving for a shorter amount of time where I realized how necessary it was to give in any sort of financial capacity. I believe that God uses every single dollar that each of us give. And I believe that the church uses every dollar that we give in the best way it possibly can because it also puts it forward, you know? It is 100% blessing the kingdom even as we are trying to do that ourselves. So I believe that giving is something that's something that we need to be called to do because it's so much greater than us and it's so much greater than the church itself. It's something where we can really pour into other people, pour into this ministry and continue to let this ministry and let this church grow because we've seen the impact it's had on us. And we're back. I find Jacob's story so inspiring. I hope that you do too. Once again, um, feel free to go on the app and check in uh, tell us that you are here. Tell us how we can connect with you and what we can be praying for you for. And now it's time for week two of our sermon series, Unprecedented Kingdom. Empires rise and fall. Dynasties disappear behind thick stone walls. Nations, they wage war over arbitrary laws. But through it all, the kingdom we speak of will not be upended. The kingdom of God is unprecedented. Hi everyone, I'm Meredith Dancaz. I'm the lead pastor here at The Well. Thanks for joining us this Sunday morning. Uh, so I had a friend in Michigan who's a structural engineer and a church, a local church, called them in because they were having problems with their building. See, uh, walls were cracking and pipes were bursting and the exterior seemed to be buckling and even like you'd walk into rooms and it was like really clear that there was a big slope going on and they were wondering what's happening to our building and so he checked it out and pretty quickly he was able to find out what was wrong and he came back to them and he said well I've got good news and bad news the good news is I'm not going to charge you for my services the bad news is I found the problem. Your church was built on a 1800 sill plate that has completely uh, disintegrated and deteriorated. And so there is no salvaging your building. You're just gonna have to tear the whole thing down. And that's the thing with foundations, right? Is they're under the surface and there's you don't know if there's a problem until there's a problem. You know, that building never had a secure foundation, but they didn't realize it because foundations are unseen until they need to be seen. And we just assume that they're secure and we assume that they're trustworthy. And we do this with buildings and we do this in life because our foundation is what we put our trust on. It's what we build our life on. And we actually need to examine it because whether it's faulty or not is really important. Henry Cloud says it like this. He says, the reality of the life we see and live on the outside is one that emerges from the inside, from our hearts, minds, and souls. It is our internal life that creates our external one. So to find our lives, we must find what lies below the surface of our skin. And so last week when we kicked off this series, Unprecedented Kingdom, we talked about how Jesus arrives on the scene and he says, repent for the kingdom of God has drawn 
near. And that word repent means not just to stop doing something, it means to change your mind, change your orientation, change your direction, to totally turn towards God and it will, it will redo everything, your thoughts, your impulses, and even your foundation. And that's what we're going to look at today. And so Jesus, after he announces his kingdom, he calls his disciples, he gathers them together, and he goes up on the top of a mountain with his disciples and this large crowd follows, and he gives what is called his inaugural kingdom address. It's often known as the Sermon on the Mount. It marks a beginning, and he lays out this is what the kingdom of God is like, and this is what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. And so this is his first famous big speech. And like all speeches, opening lines matter, right? Think about some opening lines that, that you can remember. Four score and seven years ago, right? Or uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Or life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. An opening line, it, it matters because it sets the tone. And Jesus' opening line in the Sermon on the Mount is a real shocker because he gives this series of eight different blessings. They're called the Beatitudes. And the reason why they're called the Beatitudes, it comes from the, the Latin word meaning blessed. And these blessings that really kind of turn the idea of what we know as blessing to be upside down. And his very first one would have shocked everyone because he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And this would have stopped people in their tracks. Because back then, in Jesus' time, there were nine different classes. And you know, right now, we still have a class system here in America, but it's very fluid and you can kind of move between it and, and you're not necessarily so defined. But back then, it was very rigid and very defined and you didn't really move between classes. And so the very top of the class system was the ruler. And this is a person in and of themselves, right? It's the king, the queen, the magistrate, the emperor. It's the one person who's in charge. And that person would often get anywhere between 25 and 50% of GDP total. It all went to the ruler. And then the second class right below that ruler was what was known as the governing class. And this is the 1%. And it's the bureaucrats, the nobles, the officials, and they surrounded the ruler. And that governing class also got another 25% of the GDP dispersed amongst them. And so between the ruler and the governing class, that's anywhere between 50 and 75%. And then right below them is the retainer class. And these are the, the political, they serve the political elite. They're uh, like military officers and scribes and teachers, it was about 5% of the population, uh, that retainer class. And then below them was the merchant class. And this was actually a very small class because it's mainly an agrarian uh, culture at the time. So it would have been less than 5% in Jesus' lifetime. And then the last one there of this, what is known as the ruling class, the first top five classes were known as the ruling class is the priestly class. And they one thing to know about them is they were primarily landowners as well. And so all of the lower classes worked for them. And you want to keep that in mind because think about all the parables that Jesus teaches about people who own land and the tenants on them. Because that those first five classes, that ruling class, they made up about 20% of the population. And then the rest of the 80% was much more poor and uh, made up of the peasant class. So the peasant class, they were often tenant farmers. And so you think about those parables again, where Jesus talks about the corrupt landowner or someone who you know, has the land and then kicks people off. That was their reality. They didn't own the land that they worked on uh, and they didn't, they didn't even have the crops provided for them. So two thirds of what they would make would go towards taxes and tolls and rent and then they'd have to feed their animals and you know buy stuff for the next season's crop and so they had very little to live off of they were mostly sustenance farming at that point and then below that in in a sub portion of the peasant class is the artisan class and these were skilled workers but they were dependent on a patron so while they were very gifted they often remained poor because they couldn't, they weren't like the merchant class who could go off on their own. And so Jesus actually comes from that class, from the artisan class. You've got those seven, but then the last two are in a class all of their own. And these are kind of the, the expendables, the unwanted, unneeded 
uh, unseen people of society. And so you had first the unclean, and that would be anyone, you know, in that time, if you were a different ethnicity, it also meant that you worshiped a different deity, that you had a different sovereignty. And so they, different classes would see anyone who was a different ethnicity as someone unclean. But within the Jewish community, you added things like certain people's occupation made them unclean. So people who worked with unclean animals like pigs or people who uh, worked with handling the dead, that would make them unclean. And then below them, the very bottom of the barrel is the expendable class. And that would have been about 5 to 10% of all peasants. And this is like the criminals, the beggars, the sick, the lame, lepers were in that, that bottom tier, but they were sometimes even considered a notch up within that tier. So you're talking about the lowest of the low, the destitute, those who can't take care of themselves, who can't provide for themselves. Uh, and so when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, he's not using the general term for the peasant class. He's actually using the term for the lowest class that there is, the bottom of the barrel, the most destitute there is. And he's talking about this inner poverty that we would have. He's talking about this being spiritually destitute, this recognition that you can't provide for yourself. In fact, I think the NLT translation gets at it a little bit better than sometimes the NIV, and it says this, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And so part of what Jesus is getting at, he's shocking people because he's talking about this, uh, this word for being impoverished but he's trying to get at this recognition of the need of God. And a real key word here that we have to unpack a little bit is that word blessed. What do we mean by blessed? Because if we don't quite get what Jesus is talking about, we can arrive at some weird or unhelpful conclusions. And so blessed, it really means that God's favor rests upon this person, the fullness of God's blessing. N.T. Wright says it like this. He says it, it could be translated as wonderful news. And I think that's a really good translation for this. Wonderful news for those who are poor in spirit. And Scott McKnight says, Jesus here, he's framing out for us what the good life looks like, the life that leads to flourishing and blessing. And it's not anything that we would have thought, but Jesus is not saying, blessed are you when you are poor. He's not blessing scarcity. He's not, he's not uh, making poverty something better than it really is. Because remember, when Jesus arrives on the scene and starts proclaiming the kingdom of God, last week we talked about Jesus reading from Isaiah 61, and he says, I have come to proclaim good news to the poor. And so when we think about the Beatitudes and this blessed, like wonderful news, what we can take from this is the Beatitudes are not good advice. The Beatitudes are good news. They're good news. Jesus is talking about what the kingdom of God is bringing about, the new reality that is being ushered in. And so he's saying those who recognize their spiritual destitution, those who realize they cannot provide for themselves apart from God, they are primed to receive the kingdom. They are primed to know the true riches of the kingdom of God. It's good news when you know your inner destitution. And so that, that sounds a little bit odd to us. And that's again where the kingdom of God starts with repentance, where we have to change our mind and change our foundation because he's painting the picture of a, of a good life that doesn't really match up with our picture of good life. Because more so, even back then, you know, nowadays we can talk about the health and wealth gospel, but back then they firmly believed that if you obeyed God, then God would bless you with health and wealth. And if you disobeyed God, then things like famine and exile and disease the, and poverty, those things came about as God's punishment. And so Jesus using this term of destitution would be shocking to everyone. It just doesn't make a lot of sense, but he's, he's getting at what is your foundation? What's the foundation? That's why this is the first beatitude and why it's so essential. What are you building your life upon? Reliance upon God or reliance upon yourself? And those who recognize this inner poverty 
are ready to hear the good news of the kingdom of God. And while Jesus is talking about our spiritual starting point, our spiritual foundation, here's the thing. Physical wealth is a great way to measure what your foundation is. Your, your attitude, your relationship, your response to physical wealth will give you a sense of what you're building your life on. It's why Jesus talks about money more than anything else. He says, you can't serve two masters. You can't, you're, you either are gonna serve God or you're gonna serve, and we try to fill in the blank there, all these other things, but he says money. You know, it's God or money. He says, you know, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, where your heart is, there your treasure will be. And he's, he's saying, like, what you, what you value, that's where you're going to build up treasure. That's what you're going to invest in. And we see in an encounter later on in the Gospel of Matthew, all of this kind of come into place. I'm going to read the story to you. It comes from Matthew 19, verses 16 to 30. So you can just sit back and listen for a second. Someone came to Jesus with this question. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Why ask me what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Which ones? The man asked. And Jesus replied, you must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not testify falsely, honor your father and mother, love your neighbor as yourself. I've obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. What else must I do? And Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, Go, sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth. It is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say it again. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. Then Peter said to him, we've given up everything to follow you. What will we get? And Jesus replied, I assure you that when the world is made new and the Son of Man sits upon his glorious throne, You, who have been my followers, will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has given up houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or property for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be least important then, and those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. Okay, so let's break down that story a little bit. Matthew is a follower of Jesus, and he's written this account of Jesus' teachings and his life and his miracles, and he tells us the story that Jesus is on his way, and this man comes up to him and says, teacher, what must I do to get eternal life? And that, that phrase, to get eternal life, actually, the, the Greek there is to inherit eternal life. And remember, this is an inheritance-based society. Things are handed down and to inherit you have to qualify for it you have to be deemed worthy and this eternal life means God's full blessings and so he's asking how do I qualify for the good life what does that look like for me to qualify for the good life and this man he's sincerely seeking and asking what do I do to have meaningful lasting life and Jesus his first response is he answers the question with a question he says well why do you ask me what is good There's only one who is good. And Jesus right away is challenging what this man, his framework around what he understands goodness to be. And that's something, if you hang around with Jesus enough, if you read about Jesus and follow him, you'll begin to see Jesus rarely tells people what to think, but he's always teaching us how to think. And so he's doing that work of repentance right away of, you're gonna need to change your orientation. You're gonna have to change your mind, the way that you frame everything if you really want the answer to this question. So Jesus follows up with what would have been an expected answer. You know the commandments, you know, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't slander, don't defraud, honor your mother and father. And the teaching, the common wisdom back then was if you follow the law, if you follow the rules, then you will be worthy 
of God's inheritance. You will, you will qualify to be part of God's people. And this young man says, well, I've kept all those. And you have to kind of wonder like, oh, is this a humble brag? You know, is he just being like, oh, I'm pretty good. But if you think about it, the bar seems kind of low, like don't willingly murder someone, don't willingly defraud someone, right? And so he says, well, what else must I do? And the word there, the phrase there is, what else do I lack? What else do I lack? Because he has this sense of there's something more. There has to be something more. And Jesus replies to him, he says, if you want to be perfect, and that word there is really important, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. So that word perfect there actually means to be complete. It means to be whole. And so when you hear this man say, what do I lack? And Jesus says, well, if you want to be whole, there's something that you have to do. Go and sell all your possessions. He's redefining good. He's calling this man to repent, to, to turn towards God, to see the world differently. And he's saying good isn't just following another rule. It's something totally different. And what he's really doing is he's getting at the foundation of this man's life. He's exposing that, you know, what really is holding you back is that you've built your life on something that will fail you a failing foundation, just like that church in Michigan. It's not stable. And it's only at that point in the story that we learn that this man is very wealthy. And when Jesus starts to challenge his foundation, this man, we are, we're told, he leaves away, he leaves very sad. You know, and that word there is to be, it's a deep sadness and loss. It's a devastation, just totally deflated. And the disciples are just shocked because this seems kind of extreme. This, I mean, Jesus told him, go sell everything you have, give it away, and then you can come and follow me. And the truth is, it is extreme. You know, Jesus actually doesn't tell everyone to go sell their possessions to follow him. He had wealthy followers. You know, this isn't a prerequisite to being part of the kingdom. So something else is going on here because while Jesus does talk about money a lot, there's, there's more to this story than just Money, but he goes on to shock them even further. And he says, well, I tell you the truth. It is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say it again. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus paints them this ridiculous picture because a camel would have been the largest animal that they could even imagine. And a needle would have been one of the smallest openings that they could think of. And so he gives this picture of this giant animal trying to squeeze through this tiny opening. And you know, some people have tried to make that less metaphorical, but it's, it's, it's the way that Jesus talks. He gives us these word pictures to help us see something is impossible. He's painting this impossible picture you, that could never happen. And so we have to ask why. Why is it so difficult for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? Is Jesus just picking on rich people? Is that, is that his problem? You know, does he not like wealth? Does he not like wealthy people? But again, I don't think that's what's going on here because I don't even think this is a story about wealth. I think this is a story about trust. And what Jesus is exposing is you can't inherit eternal things if you build your whole life on a temporal foundation. They just, it won't hold up. It won't hold up. John Ortberg says this, we live in a world that teaches us to be more concerned with the condition of our cars or our careers or our portfolios than the condition of our souls. And that's what Jesus is trying to get at is this faulty foundation because that's the foundation the world offers us. The world offers us a foundation of financial security. And here's the thing, it feels like a solid foundation. It feels like it's something that you could build your life on. And if many of us actually stepped back and looked at our life, we would relate a lot to this young man. That sure, we wanna follow Jesus and we believe in Jesus, and but underneath it, our greatest trust is in our own ability to secure our own security through, through financial security, through our own advancement. And in Western society, we measure success by your role, your position, your 401k, how much money you have. And we believe that the more money you have, the more satisfied you'll be. And social scientists, they found a couple things to be true about money. One 
is actually some money can indeed make you happier to an extent, to an extent. So those who are in, uh, in financial distress, where you're wondering, how am I going to pay my rent, and my medical bills, and pay for food, and just cover the basic needs of life? There is a there's a stress that comes with that. That when you when you reach a certain financial threshold, there actually is a deeper sense of security and a deeper sense of happiness that comes along with that. But here's the second thing they found: being rich does not make you feel any richer. Everyone. All of us, rich or poor, are equally dissatisfied with our wealth because what they found is that money actually has a diminishing return, that there's a certain amount where actually we do have a deeper life satisfaction, and they've actually tried to nail that down. So some people said 60000 for an individual, other people said 90000 and they kind of landed at 75000 So there's your, there's your target. If you get to $75,000, you will be happy, but then you add in cost of living charges, and then you add in a family, and it just becomes this moving target, right? But there is a degree that life can feel more satisfying with a certain amount of money, but it has a diminishing return that once we cross that threshold where our basic needs are met and we're not stressed out about you know, just surviving, we actually become less happy and less dissatisfied the more money that we have. Because here's the thing about money. It certainly can make life fun. It can make life way more fun. You, know, you can go on better vacations and buy faster cars and live in fancier houses and nicer clothes and all that's fun. But life is not more meaningful the more money that you have. Money cannot buy you meaning. And so when it comes to eternal things, if you've built your life on a foundation, the foundation that the world offers of financial security, it will fail you. It will fail you. And when Jesus begins to expose that this man has built his whole, the thing that's lacking, the thing that's holding him back is the foundation, well, it's costly. It's going to cost him. You know, it, it's not easy to change your foundation. And that's what some dear friends of mine, friends of mine actually found out. They are two of my very best friends. I've known them for years and years. And they are some of the most faithful followers of Jesus I've ever known. They have helped so many people start a relationship with Jesus. And they've grown up in the faith and they are strong believers. And about 13 years ago, they had this opportunity to buy a house right outside of Boston. And it was this three-story home and they were going to, they had all these plans that they were going to turn it into a rental as well, and they had some, you know, a space that they were going to let missionaries come and stay, and uh, it was going to be their retirement plan. And they invested. They went in big and they invested, and they started, you know, renovating the house. And then they found out there was a huge crack in the foundation, and it was going to be a huge cost to fix. But they had to, or else the house would no longer be structurally sound. So they put the money in to fix the foundation, and very shortly after, the market bottomed out in 2008. And they, here they were, left with this house that went underwater by hundreds of thousands of dollars that they just couldn't get out of. And as the, as the foundation of their house felt like it was cracking, they realized, oh, the foundation of their life was also cracking because all of the plans that they had made, all of the things that they had invested in just disintegrated overnight, it felt like. And they were left holding this disappointment and this anger, and they had to realize that their trust had shifted over time. That while they were followers of Jesus, they had started to trust in their plans more than any plan that God might have for them. They had started to trust in their ability to provide security for themselves more than anything that God could provide for them. And so their life plans began to crumble and they were just distraught. And maybe you can relate. I mean, maybe you've made a big plan. Maybe even right now you are, you have plans on plans on plans and you know where life is going and you're going to hit this financial mark and then this financial mark. And maybe that was your plan. And then it all bottomed out at some point and you're left going, what happened? Where is God in this? But my friends eventually had to start to realize that their plans, and many of us have to realize that our plans are often holding us back from what God actually wants for us. Again, this quote from John Ortberg says it well. He says, the desperate need of the soul is not for intelligence, nor talent, nor yet excitement, just depth. 
The soul is the deepest part of you. For much of our lives, we live in the shallows and something happens, a crisis, a birth, a death, and we get this glimpse of tremendous depth. My soul becomes shallow when my interests and thoughts go no further than myself. A person should be deep because life is deep. A deep soul has the capacity to understand and empathize deeply with other people, not just himself. A deep soul notices and questions and doesn't just go through the motions. A deep soul lives in conscious awareness of eternity, not simply today. See, for Jesus, the only real asset that matters is your character, is your soul. It's the only thing you take with you at the end of life. And so Jesus is not so concerned with your 401k or your credit score or your career trajectory. He is mostly concerned with who you become. And this is why he presses on that foundation because a temporal foundation cannot give you eternal blessing. And a temporal foundation cannot give you eternal blessings. See, Jesus didn't tell this man to go sell all of his stuff because Jesus doesn't like stuff, right? That's not what's happening here. Jesus isn't prejudiced against wealthy people. He's not anti-money in that way. He didn't, you know, my friend's plans didn't fall apart because Jesus was mad that they bought a house because Jesus doesn't like people owning houses. That's, that's not what's going on here. But Jesus is always trying to get under the surface and help us see what are you building your life on? What's the foundation? And the disciples struggle with this. You know, they see all of this and they say, you know, who then, then who in the world can be saved? You know, and it's, it's the question because this is extreme. You just said, you know, how hard it is for a rich person to enter into the kingdom. It's like a camel trying to go through the eye of a needle. And for them, well, if you're rich, then you have God's blessing. So if they can't be saved, who then, who can be saved? And I love this. Because it says, Jesus looked at them intently. And that look, before he answers them, it's this searching look. It's this weighing look. Because he knows he's about to deliver to them an essential truth. Something that they must grasp to understand anything. And he says, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. And what he's saying there is, Apart from God, everything else will fail. Every other foundation will fail you. Jesus is the only sure foundation for our life. It's the only, he's the only thing that we can possibly build on. That's it. And there's something that we often miss in this, in this interaction because Jesus does tell that man to go and sell all of his possessions. But he doesn't do it just to have him sacrifice, just to be, you know, just to suffer for suffering. Say, Jesus isn't trying to be a downer here. He's trying to set us free because he says, go sell your stuff and then you will have treasure in heaven. See, Jesus is trying to shift our, our understanding of what security means and what treasure means and what good means and what rich means. And he says this, I assure you that when the world is made new, that means when the kingdom of God comes in full, the Son of Man, that's Jesus, sits upon his glorious throne. You who have been my followers, he's talking to his disciples there, will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel and, and everyone, this is for us, and everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake, not just to give it up, but for the sake of following Jesus, being part of the gospel, will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be least important then, and those who seem least important now will be the greatest. See, we're not just called to poverty. Remember, the, the Beatitudes are not good advice, they're good news. We're called to abundance. It's just a different definition of abundance. Jesus's kingdom is all about abundance but it's about eternal abundance. And that requires a great amount of trust. That trust that requires repentance to turn and change the way that we think about the world. That there is sacrifice involved. There is sacrifice, but it's sacrifice for freedom's sake. It's sacrifice for abundance sake. This is why he says the foundation of all of this is being poor in spirit, is recognizing your utter dependence 
on God for anything to matter. If you really want to inherit the kingdom, if you want to know the true riches, you have to start with being poor in spirit. And God is about giving us a heavenly, lasting treasure. An earthly treasure can never fill that. And that's what my friends had to eventually learn. See, they never recovered financially from that. They, they end up having to short sell their house. Their credit took a huge hit. Over 10 years later, they're still renting. And they're, they now live in California and they're surrounded by people who are building their, their lives on this faulty foundation. But through all of that, as things started to crumble and their plans started to fall apart, they started to ask this question of, why does retirement matter so much to me? Like, is that the point of life? Is that the whole meaning of life is to retire early and wealthy? Like, is that the highest calling that God has for us? And they began to see that God, God wants depth for them. God wants meaning for them. And that God is not as concerned about your 401k as he is about your soul. And so life is more than 401ks and credit scores and portfolios and houses and all of that. It's the depth of soul, that meaningful life. You know, how can I inherit eternal life? How can I be part of the kingdom? It comes from building a foundation on your dependence on God. And so the question for us as we close here is, what are you building your life on? What is your foundation? You know, looking at our relationship with wealth and possessions gives us a really good sense of what foundation we're building on. And just like opening words are important because they set the, the tone and Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. Jesus's closing words for the Sermon on the Mount are just as important because it kind of frames it all up. And he says this at the close. He says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes down in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand, when the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crush, crash. And it's not just enough to want to follow Jesus or listen to the teachings of Jesus. I mean, that, that young man sincerely wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. And it's not just enough to do all the right things and follow the right rules. Jesus wanted to challenge what good is, it's about trust. That's really the foundation of everything. To follow Jesus, to, to, to live this out, to, to build your house on a solid foundation is to put all of your trust, to go all in on the kingdom of God. And so to be a citizen of God calls us to live differently. To be uh, someone who wants to live in God's kingdom, we have to align our hearts with the things that Jesus loves and the things that Jesus teaches and the things that Jesus says. And so I want to challenge us this week around what does it look like to not just hear these words, but to actually live them. And remember, this is not good advice, meaning go and be poor, but it is a, a test of where is your heart aligned. And whether you're a follower of Jesus or you're just starting to figure Jesus out, all of us all of us could do uh, with a little bit of loosening of the grip that wealth gets on our life. Because, I mean, they tell us money can only make you so happy. So, you know, I want to come back to that beatitude that we started with. Wonderful news for the poor in spirit. Wonderful news. Why? Because you are starting on a foundation that you can build a life that matters. When you actually recognize what is meaningful, when you recognize what is solid in life, then you can receive the kingdom, this kingdom that Jesus says is full of abundance and life. So what can we do to start to align our hearts towards that way? Well, I'm not going to tell you to go and sell all of your possessions to, to um, start following Jesus. Again, that's not a prerequisite, but I am going to tell you to look around your home and to wonder what do, would it look like to maybe go and sell something that, that maybe you are a little too attached to and give that money away, or maybe to start giving somewhere. You know, you can give here at the well if you don't already, uh, but to, to start to loosen that grip, you know, to say, it doesn't all have to be mine. It's not about accumulating. Money can get in the way of receiving the riches of the kingdom of God. 
because it's this faulty foundation. It's a foundation of sand. But we are blessed. We are, we are framed up to, to live the good life, the life of blessing and flourishing when we start first on the right foundation, the foundation of utter dependence. So I'm going to challenge you. Do something to really evaluate your relationship with your wealth and your possessions to see how attached am I to these things and can I begin to loosen that grip enough to really begin to receive all that Jesus has for me. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for this time together. Thank you that you remind us that your kingdom is one of abundance and one of life and freedom. Help us to have the courage to look at our own foundation, Lord, what we've been building our lives on and see if maybe we've been putting our weight and we've shifted our trust too much into our own ability to secure our finances and our future that we actually can't receive all the abundance that you have promised us in your kingdom. Help us to use our worldly wealth in a way to advance your heavenly kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.